And this is where I always tell people, look, follow the money. It requires effort, it requires engagement, true engagement. You gotta say yes. Some way, somehow, say yes. That's where the innovation comes. We cannot be complacent. So last night we're in your clubhouse room, no BS, wealth building and deals and, and such. And you brought up a, a, an interesting point that went against some of the people in the, on the stage. And that was, well, I mean, it was basically you felt it was critical or that one of the biggest things or a business leader could do in terms of having a, an immediate impact, the biggest impact, I think you said, on catapulting their business or boosting it would be to look and I'd be able to be open enough and understand what their true weaknesses are and then turn those weaknesses into strengths. Why do you feel like that was so important? And then also, why, why is it so controversial, I guess? It's controversial because some people are just haters and, and, and if they can't do what you can't do, they try to tear you down. That's first and foremost. But let's take a, a look from another perspective. If you're not good at fundraising, right, that, and you're the founder and you hire someone else to fundraise for you, like, how are you going to grow, right? If you're not good at building relationships with, because the, the theme was turn your weakness to your strengths. Your strengths got you to where you are here. Your weakness is why you're not advancing, right? So delegating the high level relationship building to somebody else, that doesn't work. So that doesn't make sense unless you have a business partner does the opposite. But if you're not good at sales, right? You need to turn yourself into a good salesperson because you apply yourself to everything. If you're not good at marketing, Whatever you're not good at is why you're stuck. So the point is, you know, right, you're going to delegate what you're not good at to people who make five, six figures and expect them they're going to make millions of dollars. That doesn't make sense. So that was spoken to people that are worth six, seven figures. And, and, and that's what they say, right? Um, if, I, if, I, if she didn't run away, because that's what people do, they run away. I asked a few questions. I quickly would have realized, you know, what you do if you're telling me the truth. Because I could tell having discussions between a nine figure, eight figure, seven figure, five figures, and still have a job. It's it, the, the different levels require a different way of changing. Just like I said, how you make your first 100,000 different than a million, millions different than 10, 10 is different than 100, 100 is different than a billion. At every level, you have to reset yourself, reset the way you think, reset the people on your team, reset the discussions you have, reset certain skills. Doing more of what you're doing now doesn't get you more money or more advancement. So how you change is how you succeed. So this notion that I can outsource everything, great, I find myself the best marketer, that's half a million dollars right? But is that person going to generate me $100 million or $50 million or $10 million? Or is it your idea that's visionary? So, I mean, it's controversial to people who, you know, who are narrow-minded. If, if a debate is controversial and, and if they come up with very much facts, you know, number, numbers and statistics, then it's a, it, you, it could justify it. But in my opinion is you're the founder, you're the visionary. And a lot of these companies are driven by the founders. Jeff Bezos, they're driven by uh, Richard Branson. They're driven by Steve Jobs in some way. And you know, managing people wasn't a great attribute of Steve Jobs. Well, he knew when he came back to Apple and maybe learning from his past experiences that if he didn't change and did become better at that, better at asking other people's advice that he wouldn't be where he is. So he changed and Apple became ultimately now one of the most valuable companies in the world. Uh, I would argue that Microsoft, their inability to change, Steve Ballmer and, uh, and Bill Gates did a wonderful job, but it wasn't until Ballmer left that Microsoft has exploded because they were able to change the way they look, the, the way they look at different things as well. So as a CEO, we'd be like, oh, I need to be more open to this as opposed to doing what I know. So that's the point. As a, as a visionary, as a CEO, as a lot of people watching here, there's always that change and adjustment. Well, and I also think people take it take you literally sometimes in, in, in the sense that not that what you're saying, you mean it literally. Being a CEO needs to be in there doing all the marketing. You're saying the CEO needs to know it as well or turn it into a strength. Or how do you have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with your marketing manager or your, your vice president of sales or whatever it might be? Is that accurate? Yeah. Well, my coach said to me, he builds high rises, right? Big, big down, big, big buildings downtown Chicago. And he knows what everything costs. So that when people send a bid, he knows whether he's getting screwed or not. Right. Because he has my money. Point. I, I'm not doing the work, but I know if I'm being screwed. So if someone says, you know what, it's going to cost me 300 grand to do an electric thing, like, no, 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 it's 150, right? And so, or uh, unless you're putting this type, or you know what, yeah, they're doing 150, it's cheaper, but they're not using the proper, you need to know that because then you're delegated to somebody. No, and by the way, when the thing catches on fire because you went cheaper, 
nobody blames the employee. They blame the person at the top, right? Yeah. The person at the top takes all the credit, but also takes all the fault. We're 100 responsible for every decision, whether we make it or not. That's called leadership. And unfortunately, we lead from the front. You can't blame other people, even if it's not your fault. That's why the CEO of Wells Fargo's got fired because of all these, these accounts that were open. I'm pretty much sure he knew nothing about it. I'm almost positive, right? But you know, his head got chopped off. Somebody um, got fired at Credit Suisse today because of the $4.6 billion write-off they had because of dealing with the uh, family office. Someone made that decision, right? right? Someone trusted another person. So, I mean, so. so all- let's go back in time. Let's go back in time because I, I know you're a big proponent of practicing what you preach and, and what you teach. And so at what point, let's go back. What were some of your early weaknesses that you had to turn into a strength? Well, everything. Uh, I had a speech impediment. So speaking was one of them. Uh, sales, I couldn't sell. For every 100 people I go to, I'd close maybe one, maybe. Uh, marketing, I didn't know anything about marketing. Uh, branding, I had zero clues about branding. Building relationship, especially people that have more money than me. Right. Like a lot of people don't know how to talk to rich people. Right. And I said to a rich person, well, I put on my pants, same pants that you do. And he goes, yeah, I put mine on my private jet. You're sleeping on the guy's couch. <laughs> like there's this notion, like people that were all equal. I, I disagree. You know what I mean? You're not equal to Elon Musk. Neither am I. You're not going to go to Elon and say, hey, we're the same. No. Elon Musk is about $196 billion ahead of you. So he's not. And he's able to do things. He's putting more work, more effort to go on more risks. So I don't compare myself against people that have less than me. I want to compare myself to people that have more than me. And compared to people how you have so much success, so many companies. Yeah, compared to everybody else, 99.9%, I'm doing better than everybody else. Compared to Elon Musk, I'm at 0.01%. Let me repeat that. I'm at 0.01%. And I'm, I might even be at 0% co- co- compared to Elon. Right? I, I, so, la- I laugh at these clubhouse rooms when you come out and you ask, what's your net worth? What do you do? And these people get all upset about it. You don't want to have necessarily this. You want to know how to have the conversation. So you're asking a a qualifying question because for one, you're gauging your opinion based on of of this person's expertise. You want to talk to people about certain subjects if they're qualified to talk about it. Well, I thought about that yesterday. Like there was, you know, a former CEO team mobile and and, and Greg Cardone and myself, we were going back and forth on something, right? And someone interjected themselves. And then it's turned into a whole drama situation, which is highly entertaining, but it turned into a drama situation. And I thought about it last night because it was like the third night I discussed it. And I said to myself, it's the equivalent of you have the Yankees are playing on the field, hypothetically speaking. And someone from the peanut gallery came on the field and tell us that he's going to, he can help us the team. Like it, it just, it's just not, <laughs> not the right place, but that's true. It made me based on what he was worth and, and, and things like that. Not to say he can't, I just, like I, I can go head to head because I have a similar net worth or in the same range. But if it was three billionaires, I don't interject my, my, my opinion at all. I keep my mouth shut. And, and I was also shut up, listen and learn. You learn a lot more by listening than open your mouth. And I think that's one thing because what, why we do that, why the peanut gallery talks really is because we want to impress. But there's nothing I can personally say that is going to impress any billionaire, except for one thing, examples of loyalty, and persistence on deals and opportunities, but that's the only thing. But you know, what I own is not going to impress them. Uh, what I've accomplished is not going to impress them. There's nothing that is going to impress anybody. So you have to be you, put your head down, have a great attitude, be persistent, be loyal, have it be a person of ethics, don't blur the lines, have a work eth- amazing work ethic, stay positive, and have no fear. And if you fear nothing, they fear you. So who are you relying on for coaching or mentors? I've had nine. I have four. Uh, and by the way, I've recorded every one of my coaching sessions from broke to where I am today. Like if they go to Millionaire Flicks on top, like they literally can hear when I was broke 10 years ago to where I am today. Every mistake, every failure, every piece of advice, over 700 hours of coaching that I've received. Nobody else, even fighting with staff or firing people, hiring people, problem. I document it and I still do, you know, I was, I was, I just had a, a, I made a decision that I want to be up next Blackstone because I, I'm doing super well, but I'm not Blackstone. I'm getting outbid by Blackstone. I'm outsmarted by Blackstone. So I may be the big fish in the small pond, but I'm a teeny weeny fish in the big pond. So I want to be the big fish in the big pond. Who's the big fish in the big pond, right? Blackstone. 
So I'm studying Blackstone, Steve Schwartzman. I read the book the first time. I'm now rewrite it again. I'm reading every article there is about Blackstone, how they built a company, how they raised capital, how they built a culture, how they look at deals, how they able to go global as well. So that's what I'm, I'm taking a look at. And I had a coaching session about this. And I had another coaching about, um, about this big cloud thing, about you know starting a, a coin and having my name. And I know I could pump it up and make a lot of money, call it JT Fox coin. But my coach said to me, JT, would you let me put $25,000 into a coin? Would you let your family put that in? Would you let your best friends put a coin? I'm like, no. He goes, why not? Well, because I, I can't control what's going to happen, right? Like, I don't know. It's like, it seems risky. He goes, exactly. So your mindset of not putting your clients into it, because by default, by having it, your clients are going to put in it. So I, that's the point. The point is, um, if it's not good enough for my clients, it cannot be good enough for me. Or if it has to be good enough for me, it has to be good enough for my client as well. So this whole notion of you can't go to a store and like, Hey, uh, here's my JT Fox coins, you know? And I think all that, and, and people said to me, um, this person's in it, this person's in it. So I did a little research. Well, you know, the Winklevoss twins, they own part of the platform, right? So so they, they, they own part of the platform. So of course they're in it. So I, I don't know. I, I think this whole world is, I, I like to compare the economies. Everybody is at the craps table. Everybody's rolling the dice and everybody's winning, yeah. right? Bitcoin, NFTs, real estate, stock, you know, everything you do is winning. But at the end of the day, the house always wins. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but you can get wiped out. And I don't want to be that guy that had this giant stack and lost it, right? Now it's frustrating because sometimes you're watching like, oh, could I have done more or could I, you know, it's frustrating. So I think, I think it takes discipline. Building wealth is a long-term thing, right? Yeah, but we've I become saw, very- I saw your content. Good. Yeah, so so short term, I think. So yes, yeah, so I recorded every one of my, my my coaching, and I've always been transparent that people can listen to it, and that's what makes me unique because I go through the same problem as you and everybody else. So I agree with you. I think that like right now, everything it's almost like everything you touch, and somehow the money's just coming from all different directions, right? And so, in what ways is the structure or the way you approach your business? Uh, changed in the last year uh well number one i think i make a lot of money with little risk and, and that a lot of rich people do i haven't been as aggressive and maybe i lost out i mean i dumped everything on the stock market at twenty six thousand. i got in so i was at the mark was like twenty nine thousand before the pandemic i sold at twenty six thousand. everything sold again at twenty four thousand. went down to eighteen thousand. bought in at nineteen thousand. sold everything at twenty six thousand. now yeah it's at thirty three thousand now and I should have like maybe held on and made more money. But the hard part is there's nothing wrong with taking your profit. So I get bothered that the market went up. I could have made more money, but I would have been just, I would have been more devastated if the market had gone down. So there's nothing wrong with taking a profit. Greed, you know, pigs get slaughtered. So greed uh, tends to, there's some people that have this innate ability to be like, whatever happens, happens. You know, I like sure things. So now I do a lot of deals, but they're diversified and they're cross collateralized against other assets they own. So it's kind of sure things that I like to invest in. Of course, there's no such thing as a sure thing, but I'm extremely conservative in that approach as well. And then once in a while you find like this great needle in the haystack, and then I triple down on that needle in the haystack and that gives me X return. There's some people, as soon as they have money to deploy the capital, I like to hold a certain amount of my capital. So for example, 10% of my money is what's I call extra high risk, right? I'm either gonna make more money than I've ever dreamed of or I'm gonna lose it all. That's the mindset. But let's say you have a million dollars and you put a hundred thousand, right? It's not, I'm going to make $120,000, like $20,000. It needs to be, I need to make $800,000. Like the risk has got to be proportionate to the risk. Some people are willing to lose a hundred thousand to make 20. If I'm going to lose a hundred grand, I need to make 800,000. That's number one. Right. Number two. Um, and then 50% of my money is anywhere between 22, 12 to 22%, but it's secured by an asset, whatever that asset is, real estate, personal guarantee, cross collateralization, equipment, you know, we're doing a deal where cross collateralizing gets 150 equipment, uh, uh, vehicles that they have that they're own free and clear. So there's always that guarantee. And then the rest is like less than 11%, you know, but more so around 6%, but it's like sure things, you know what I mean? Like I'm not going to lose. Right. I, I, I find that you're not really going to find sure things at eight, nine, 10% that kind of goes into the 12 to 18%. And for me, it's not really worth to make 8%, 10% on any of Last night, you asked a good question, like what was the, uh, I think it was, what was some of the biggest, for each individual you were asking, what was the biggest misconception about wealth? 
and answers went all over it, but no one said what you just said. And so one of the mis biggest misconceptions I think about building wealth is everyone thinks that rich people took nothing but high risk and that's how they became wealthy. Yeah, well, no, they take big risk when they start. But when they make it, they take less risk, except Elon Musk, except Bezos. Because what happens, they go all in. And, and that's just not me. And by the way, they go all in, but the payoff is huge. But don't forget, Elon Musk was twice to having lost Tesla, twice, right? Yeah. Twice. Yep. So, I mean, and, and, and then the pandemic took off. And, but you got to give the guy credit. I mean, it's just, it's just, you know, but also he loves to mess around with people. You know, the Deutsche coin sets up the stupid coin and it goes over $200. You know what I mean? Um, and so it's things like that that just, that, you know, whatever he says, people think is a, the Bible and then it automatically goes up. It's kind of like the golden touch. I think he likes messing with people. And also look at how many people were bet betting that he was going to fail, including Bill Gates, by the way, who had a big short yep. position on, on Tesla. So I think Bill Gates lost $15 million or something like that on shorting Tesla. So, I mean, yeah. everybody was betting against. So don't bet, against, don't bet against Elon. But here's the thing, one, your one, you know, SpaceX, your one spaceship exploding from, you know, <clears throat> with astronauts in there uh, hurting. So you're always one, one instance from takes a lifetime to build a brand five minutes to destroy it. So business coaching, obviously a big part of what you do. How is that? I mean, obviously your clients have had to change over the last say nine years, 10 years. So how's that evolving for you? How big of I mean, a chunk I, is that I, with I, what you're doing now? Yeah. I mean, I, I majorly deal with high net worth individuals or celebrities now or billionaires or stuff like that. And I prefer taking pieces of companies um, because that's just more exciting for me as well. But you know, I used to do it every day. I do it like once a week, but I mentor people for free. And once in a while, I'll find somebody. I'm like, all right, I'll work with you. I'll give you 95% off. Um, you know, because if I think they have that fire in between, you know, people go to my Instagram and, and there's a link there um, and it's free. And I just, I just, but I, I do it to learn. I mean, that's really how I dominated clubhouses by understanding what people like and didn't like. And I just did more of that. So in a way for me, it was like, hey, I created content. That's number one. And number two, uh, I was able to learn about what type of people there are, which then allowed me to give the audience exactly what they need and what they want. And so, so sometimes it's research, understanding for people and understanding what everybody goes through. Cause sometimes you can be desensitized. Like you're you can be out of touch with what the problem is. Cause I don't like excuses. I just say, I can't stand it. Like to me, excuses are a form of disease. So I get to learn, you know, and also I realized it doesn't matter where there are people in the world. Cause there's people all over the world that listen to it. Everybody has the same problems. Fear, procrastination, time, spouse, um, the right, the, the wrong knowledge, knowledge overload, lack of accountability, focus. It's all the same thing. Don't have a coach. So there's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. There isn't. That's why I still have four coaches that I pay. They're worth between 400 to $800 million. And uh, every week I get a coaching session. I got one a few days ago. So we have a client, top five top five business in the world, right? And it's not that we handle all their digital marketing, but uh, we are an agency of record for them. And so in meetings with them, it always blows me away. And I'm bringing this up because I've seen you say this a couple of times. Everyone has the same issues and you were kind of just alluding to it. When I talk to these businesses and I'm sitting here thinking about all the issues we deal with as a company or an agency and, and various stuff that we, I do, it's all the same. Can't find salespeople, struggle with the marketing in this area. How do I get my customers to understand this? I mean, it's the same stuff, regardless of the size of the company. Let's talk. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that has to go into what you're seeing on the coaching side. Same problems. Everybody has the same problems. Um, you know, the religion may be different and maybe the culture is different, but everyone has the same problems. If you want to make a lot of money, you need to solve problems and find solutions for your customers. The biggest problem is solve more creative solution. So a lot of it is a lack of accountability, right? And so, you know, people have this idea, there's no one pushing them. Managers are usually not good leaders or, um, you know, people are lazy. And, um, you know, that's why, I mean, think about it. 96% of businesses don't make a million dollars a year. If, if you earn, everyone's worried about becoming a millionaire, but if you earn $422,000 a year, you're in the top 1% income earning. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's like, <laughs> think about that. You're better than 99% of the people in the United States and probably 99.5% of everybody in the world if you earn $422,000 a year. 
So yeah. that, that, and sometimes we get like billionaire or, or 10 million or, or, or million. We get caught up in the number. Just focus on being on top 1% and then everything takes care of itself. Bottom line, if you want to become successful, if you take care of your clients, your clients will take care of your success in your bank account, right? And That's the a, happiness of customers is a byproduct of how big your bank account is. It's the first thing I, I, when I started my business, I was 22 years old when I started my thing and I had no business knowledge. I had nothing. I just had confidence in my selling ability and I had to learn the other stuff. And so for me, I, I just came from the mindset. I started, I was, I went through different phases, I should say in business. When I first started off, it was not about the income to me. I had the luxury at that age, I was still living at home. So I had no responsibilities. I, it was very easy for me to take risk. Uh, I was not the normal person in that sense, right? I could take risk. I didn't have to worry about the bottom line as much. My fo sole focus was take care of the customer. I wanted to have the best product and the best service. And I figured the money would come, which happened as things evolved. I slipped into a bad habit at, at one stretch of starting to focus more on that bottom line and worrying more about my company and less about my customer. And sure enough, things started to come down and we had to recommit back to, to going to that. We, re, we were smart enough, fortunately, to recognize that trend and, and that mistake, right? And you brought that up a lot last night in terms of the value creation and worrying about your customer putting that top priority and the rest kind of follows. Let's talk a little bit about that. Cause I, I think that's spot on. Allergies killing me today. Um, it's like that time of year where you got allergies. Um, I don't know. I mean, like people like you and me and people that are watching this, right? It doesn't matter what we do. We're going to figure it out. Right. And and we don't do our best, we do whatever it takes. So when I take a look at you, it doesn't matter what business you are, you'll figure out because the, the principles are the same. They're really, the fundamentals of the business are the same, right? Marketing, branding, sales, and building relationship. Those are the core, and then you can add negotiation perhaps in there, but those are the core principles as well. So in anything that people will listen to, wealth building is more of a skill set, right? It's it's about improving your skills. It's not finding a system. There's no marketing system. There's no business system. There's no, it's skills. And the better you are at sharpening the skills. And by the way, you are your greatest ROI. So, you know, I take a look at how you've achieved a lot of success or, or you take a look at, you know, Bruce Springsteen in the back of you, right? He has longevity because number one, he has the work ethic. He has the sustainability. Same thing with the Rolling Stones. Same thing with everything. So you may not you know, agree or like his politics or whatever. Um, but, you know, he is always re trying to reinvent himself, trying to do things differently yeah. and not to become successful. You have to be uncomfortable. And, um, and I think that's, that's what makes you very good at what you do and, and me because being comfortable leads to procrastination. So I, I just take a look at in the end of the day, if you never quit, you'll always win at life. And I think most people quit too soon on their idea, on themselves, on the people. Um, if you never quit, you never lose. And uh, I think people and people create the excuses and they, they don't take responsibility for failures. You know, if I mess up, it's my fault. It's just and I think that's a big point about success. Yeah. So. All right. So let's say you're looking at a business to invest in or get some type of equity in. What are like the big opportunities like that? attract you to that that business or that industry that that makes you want to move forward well, what, first what are the your people. top things yeah the first is the people because it could be a great business but if the people suck it's not going to make sense um number two how different that they are <clears throat> how different they are the competition what do you have that they don't have that's an important part of the process as well and also what's the ability that's going to succeed um, that's a big thing too as well um, and also how much runway do they have? Runway means how much money they have to, to survive as well. Um, but a lot of companies are really founder driven. And at first it's about the people. I mean, we're in blockchain, crypto mining, real estate, commercial developments, residential developments, um, you know, a couple of big apps I'm involved. Like, so I'm involved in so many different diverse, but I think what, what attracts me is the people um, because I know they have this, kind of the a player thing people like who are watching this still 
who didn't quit and yourself. And we just found a way to work out. So it's not so much the business because the people are the ones that are going to figure it out. And then, and unfortunately it gets to a level where the founder, we're like pirates, right? We're rebels, we're mavericks. And then you get to a level that it needs to be run like a Navy. And that's what we're not good at. And that's where we need to step away. Kind of like, you know, Travis Cragnet at Uber and a lot of other companies, they step away. It's not the same founders. Not everyone's a Fred Smith, right? Because you have to step away because it's a different skill set, right? Your, your, your business becomes like a Navy, more efficient, more orderly, more rules. And as an entrepreneur, right? That's when you go from an entrepreneur to corporate. And a lot of us don't have it inside us. I mean, some do, but that's not me. Like I could never, like I have to be a free bird. And you, you can be like Richard Branson, but he has a different model right? He's just kind of licensing to a lot of companies, does what he wants, but he's not the head of the airlines or anything. He's just a figurehead that comes up with crazy ideas. And he basically does things to further the brand, but he's not in the office every day. It's a Necker Island or, or, so that's kind of like the way I am too. I just, you know, I wonder if I just did one thing, how much wealthier I could be. And I've got a, obviously a substantial net worth, but I have to do a lot of things. I don't know why, or else I'd get too bored. Well, you also want the leverage of, of, of having the multiple income stream. So uh, earlier you said gaining wealth or growing wealth is a skill set. So like, what are some of those specific skills that you see some of the wealthiest people? Well, what do they have? Salespeople, and they can sell. I mean, whether it's raising capital, getting people to do things you want. Uh, number two, they understand what the customer wants. I think that's a skill. Um, number three, they're able to see things eight moves ahead of everybody else, right? Most people think in like the now they think in the future and they understand risk, right? If you take risk out, you take opportunity out and they understand how to manage and control risk. Um, most people are black or white when it comes to risk, you're either taking a risk or you're not taking a risk, but I think there are shades of risk. Um, and most people don't see it that way. So what do you look for in a, a business leader? So you, here you are, you, you said you want, the people are important, right? So obviously you're probably looking at top leadership first. And so what are the main char characteristics? And I, I, I'm i not looking for the common answers, right? I, I What are some of the yeah. things that really stand I, out to you? I lead from the front. And what do I mean by that? Action is not, everything I ask from people is something I've done myself or I would be willing to do myself. I think I remember a couple of times I had to like roll up my sleeves and help break down a ballroom so that we could have a main act. Like I didn't say I'm, I'm too good and I'm not, I just, I, I get involved where I have to, to get it done. A lot of people say, well, it's not my job, right? And I think that this attitude, you know, with a leader, everything's your job. Now, if I'm doing that job to save money, that's a different story, right? That's, it, that's the small thinking. But if you step in, I think that's an important thing to me. Um, and number two, you, you, I think you have to, you know, you have to see things in people that they don't see themselves. That's, that's the thing. And you have to harness that power. You have to get a different gear. I think not everyone comes to you in fifth gear and you have to learn how to shift them. Right. And you have to understand what motivates people and what demotivates people. And, um, and, and you, you should never see them sweating. I mean, the worst thing for a leader is, is, it's kind of like a mama bear, you know, or mama lion. You can't, if you're injured, you can't let him because that affects the psyche, which is really hard because sometimes we want to be transparent. And uh, second of all, too, your ability to change and innovate and, and be able to sell the future, you know, but that could also some downsides. If you watch that WeWork documentary about, you know, how, what the future was, it's people just bought into it. And if you can't deliver, then your whole brand and crap really goes away. What do you, what do you think as far, cause there's a lot of coaches out there. So, I mean, what differentiates you? I mean, it should be obvious. Number one, my net worth is first and foremost, right? There's, right. That, that's, that shows that I've done it. People are like, so your successful. ability that you've done it. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like before I started coaching, I'd made $10 million in real estate. You have people did three deals now that are coaches. That's number one. Right. Uh, so results first and foremost, I'm in 54 different countries. I have clients in 104. So that's a differentiation. Um, and the difference with a six figure coach is someone who, like, here's my problem. And then the coach answers back. The, the thing with me is I'm able to come up with the ideas, right? The difference between a seven, eight, nine, I mean, there's no really nine figure coaches. There's only like Tony and I maybe, um, but the ability to see things that to be able to come up with idea, come up with the brain, come up with a solution. 
So it's not the client saying, this is my idea. That's the difference. Um, and that comes a lot through experiences. I've gone through there as well. I always put my shows, myself in the shoes of the clients I'm coaching. Like, I'm, always what would I do? I'm, I'm always curious. If I was in your shoes, right? And I'm going into business after business after business, and I'm coaching these high level CEOs, at some point, there has to be so much repetition in terms of just the opportunities, or is it not that case? I would think that there are a handful of things that you probably see. These are some of the most common things they do. What are some of the most unique things that you've said, wow, here's a major opportunity you don't see every day? Yeah, I mean, at my level, we, there's boredom, right? I mean, it, that sets in, right? You made a lot of money. So you're like, you know, Conor McGregor, that, that <clears throat> are you hungry for more? Yeah. right when you start sacrificing let's say for people their family or family time to build it's like okay so i built this huge company i make a lot of money do i still need to right or is my hunger for even more so sometimes people lose their hunger which then takes three steps back but they rarely get it back i think once the hunger goes away it's hard to get it back uh, you've seen a lot of championship fighters because you get too comfortable rocky three right i mean that's a perfect example Clubber Lang, one and more beats Rocky. Rocky has to go back. You can look at you can look at real world Mike Tyson, Buster Douglas. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's a, that's another example too. You get too comfortable. You have a lot of money. You spend it like crazy. I mean, that that you know it is. You know you have all the stuff. You're disconnected. You don't have that drive and hunger. You don't work out maybe as hard unless you love it. So it's just it's normal. You know, so a yeah. lot of it too is like. You know, am I in the right? Am I doing the right thing? Also, too, at the high level, one mistake can really affect that. So people don't want to. They really don't want to. Um, they're afraid of making that mistake because it, with the cancel culture or the, the, uh, you know, perception that you're the golden boy or girl, uh, you can't afford to make a mistake at the top, right? Because people are just waiting for you to fail. That's the way society is. We're not forgiving. We're just like. You made a mistake, haha. And we're judged by people who make mistakes like every five minutes. So, but just remember, I'm, I'm curious. You, you brought up the comfort zone stuff uh, and, and just getting comfortable and lazy a little bit and maybe lack and drive. How common, how common when you go into these businesses to help, how common do you sit back and you're in your mind, you're thinking, well, that's problem number one. How often do you see that? Uh, well, everyone's the problem's obvious, right? It's always them, first and foremost. <laughs> the problem is them. They think they know what they're doing or they're surrounded by yes people or uh, the, the problems are always very easy to spot. I know why people are not making it. Left brain, right brain, analysis by paralysis, overthinking, afraid of risk. Uh, they don't have spousal support depending on the type of business. Like, or the, you know, so the mistakes are very common. You know, how they address the, the mistake, that's different. You know, so everyone's worried about the process. I worry about the end result. What's the end result you want? Because I think the journey is different. The destination is the same. So how you go about it, what motivates people, how you coach them, you need to be hard, you need to be soft, you need to be comforting, you need to kick in the ass. Most people ideal, they want to kick in the ass. Most weak people want to cuddle and that just doesn't work. Telling you what you want to hear, it's not going to help you. The difference between coaching and cheerleading. It's true. Yeah. Point. So, all right. So what, what do you think where do you see a lot of people, CEOs especially, where are they wasting their time when they're trying to take it to the next level? Well, they, they sometimes they sweat the small stuff, like don't manage the process, manage the end results. So they start micromanaging the process or they're not connected with what happens at the bottom. You know, John Laguerre, former um, uh, CEO with, of T-Mobile, you know, he's talked to him many times. He would be on the phone listening to what the Carl Center says, right? And so I think what happens is you 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 kind of you know you think you're the CEO, you're better than everybody else, and you're not at the level, so you don't understand what's going through. I mean, it, it's a TV show, but Undercover Boss is a perfect example of like, wow, I didn't know that was going on, you know. And I don't know how much that is for TV or not, but that's a perfect example. So you have to know everything, because then you're not solving the problems because everyone's passing the buck and it goes to the top, and they're like, I didn't even know what's happening. Um, and sometimes people do it, it's too late. So I'm in heavily in auto, right? So, and if you've paid any attention to the auto industry, clearly with the internet, 
car dealers, and I've, I've got three dealerships of my own, car dealers are getting what I say kind of painted into a commodity corner. Their margins are constant, with the exception of the last 12 months, they got a lot of pressure on their margins. How do you take an industry that's extremely competitive? So when you take your marketing experience and you already said that you look for differentiators, how do you find, what's the best way to find that differentiator when you're in such a competitive industry? Well, what do you have that your competition is not offering? So number one comes to experience. You know, if you take a look at Fletcher Motors is a perfect example. Uh, I still got my car done there as well. They are just printing money like crazy um, because they create any experiences. They understand the lifetime value of their customer. They understand that people are going to buy more and more and more than once as well. Got another friend of mine that owns five car dealerships, right? Three in Vegas, two in California. And he does extremely very well because he understands the customers, he understands. And then there becomes add-ons and other products and other services that you can have, right? We all know the margins are not in the new cars. It doesn't matter who you are, we're all competing against the same thing. So it, then it becomes about experience it becomes other stuff. It's about making sure that they come back and get their car serviced by you. But because most people think about, I'm gonna get ripped off. I just did take a look at the Atlanta Falcons, the example, right? The, the football team. So they opened their new stadium, it's really nice, but they did something that nobody else did. Instead of having like $6 hot dogs, right? And you go in the family, it's like you spend 50 bucks, right? You made it 25 bucks, cheaper. Well, they actually did more in concession sales than they did in previous years, right? So they didn't say, I'm gonna take advantage of this because where else they're gonna eat? So that's the differentiation of that as well, right? It's because the perception of the car dealership is you're trying to nickel and dime me, or you're gonna add this, you're gonna add this, you don't know. So it's also understanding where are the profit margins, what are the add-ons, what are the services, you know, and things like that. And then possibly creating those relationships with car insurance companies and say, okay, we could do this and, and like strategic alliances. So you create a vertical and horizontal integration um, of the product and also giving incentive that, that when they want to come back, they're going to come back to you first and foremost. Um, and also too stepping up your online presence that, okay, maybe it's not just, you know, there, Maybe it's across the country. Maybe it's also me getting another part where I'm buying cars myself and I'm flipping them where I could get margins. So you create what, you know, that those different revenue sources, and maybe it's then creating your other add-ons and other products to be able to do that experiences. You go to the Porsche dealerships now, it's like, you know, you're buying, you know, you buy, it's like a museum. So just are little small things that I do uh, that, that you can do that could add as well. Um, but Amazon is a margin business, but in the end, you'll be in business and, and you'll go in. And then, uh, you know, a lot of people are running out of inventory now because obviously they never thought that this year would happen, but it did. So it's different for everybody. So I think it's understanding about what is the point of sales and also taking a look at what else could I do that nobody else can do. You know, I, I find this year very interesting because I think it woke a lot of people up. Everyone panicked initially right? You get, you get into March of last year and everybody's like, oh shit, what the hell am I going to do? And then, uh, but quickly adjusted and the people who were very good found ways, like you brought up the inventory. Car dealers are making a fortune right now with no cars. So what, what they've discovered is I don't need to have 500 to a thousand cars on my lot, which eat up my floor plan and, and add a lot of unnecessary expenses. And maybe I don't need this footprint by the way, in this costly car dealers have the most expensive real estate usually or close to it in the cities because they need the right location. Um, but they don't have cars. And what they've learned is I need to turn my inventory quicker, not just have it sit here. And, and they've put more uh, attention on that. And I think that can go for just about any business. I think if anything, this year is done, it has gotten so many people out of their comfort zone and expanded it. And now what you have is you have car dealers who don't want to return to the old profit levels and they've found ways to maintain these new ones in, in a scenario that if you 12 months ago, they would have said it were, was impossible. You know, I'm, I haven't deep dive, but I'd, I'd have like, I'd build a kick-ass virtual car studio where I could put any car, any color and, and recreate that or have a hologram of it as well. So it's not just inside but also what the hologram would look like of the car there would just be so real there's like and so i'd best a little no difference than how they sell developments right you're selling something that you haven't created yet as well 
but you know yeah. the model is the same and, and, and the model is the same so 